did others have in-person graduations this year or in-person graduations coming up or is it still a mix of in-person virtual yeah we had our we had ours in person i, I couldn't go i had a gis workshop that saturday but yeah the, the we when it was live streaming i saw my one of my lab assistants march across the stage i got a screenshot of her getting her degree but um, I'll just be glad to be back in the classroom in the fall and get out, get out of this chair. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, we had a graduate commencement yesterday at Spelman in person. We actually had two, one for the class of 2020 in the morning and uh, in the afternoon, the class of 2021. And Morgan had three ceremonies, uh, graduate studies and folks from last year and then also folks from uh, spring 21. Oh, that's nice that, mm. yeah, if they had to miss mm -hmm. COVID, right. How about any summer field work coming up or community work that anyone's looking forward to? Are you back in the field or in the community or teaching <laughs> through the summer? <laughs> Yeah, I'm in the middle of, uh, well, two thirds of the way through Maymester right now. And wow. so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so in fact, uh, um, yeah, Dr. Osborne jokes, you're going to be on display that we're, we're doing <laughs> urban heat islands today. Oh. And, and Atlanta is going to be the case study. And so it's going to be interactive. And I was like, please let it be warm in Atlanta today. So it looks like it's going to be in the 80s, which will be perfect for us to uh, do this. Uh, interactive heat islands assignment online. But I said, I hope it's not one of those weird days we've been having this spring where it's <laughs> in the sixties and, you know, we're trying to get uh, surface temperature readings virtually. Mm. And uh, well, You're in good shape today. It'll be about 82. Yeah. And um, one thing that we're doing, so um, Dr. Padgett knows that we at Spelman recently launched an urban heat island uh, campaign along with um, Georgia Tech um, and community-based organizations like the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. So we've had students out um, since mid-March um, collecting um, surface temperature readings. So <laughs> students from Spelman, students from Georgia Tech, and then we brought in a cohort of community residents as well um, to collect data um, in their neighborhoods. And through Spelman, we also are a part of a NOAA one day um, heat campaign this summer as well. So we're kind of gearing up for all of that um, and sort of integrating um, a, com a community science, you know, approach with our community residents, um, but also getting, you know, a number of students engaged as well. So I think at least a couple of our interns will be on today listening to this conversation. Very good. That sounds really wonderful. I might have to come down and visit. My family is um, down there and coming back to Spelman is like coming home anyway. So Nataki, be prepared. I might um, pop in to see what y'all are doing. We're ready. We're ready. Come on down. I'm, that's the beauty of being um, double vaccinated. Um, I feel like I can move about a little bit more freely. Um, once we get the gas situation under control, that's like a whole nother discussion of our dependency on Petro and how it's you, hamstrung many of us. Did you say um, dependency or stupidity? <laughs> <laughs> you know, both. <laughs> both, it oh, really okay. is. Cause look mm -hmm. at us now. And not disconnected from that urban heat island issue either. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, it is noon, at least here, Eastern time, and our attendee numbers are starting to roll up as this event goes live. Um, so in just a moment, I'm gonna give the, the formal welcome as this goes out on YouTube and to all of our registrants from SITSI Virtual. So thank you everyone for being here at the end of your semesters, at the beginning of hopefully 
moving into a new phase or back into a more comfortable old phase of education and community work and field work. And we're really honored for today's plenary for SITSAI Virtual to have a round table featuring faculty of historically black colleges and universities from around the US. Uh, this is a plenary session that has been inspired by and led by um, momentum and conversations coming out of the Citizen Science Association's Environmental Justice Practitioners Working Group. And it is a real pleasure to be able to see that effort come to fruition and to really elevate conversations that have been happening as the title of this roundtable says, always on the front lines in these spaces, in these institutes of higher learning um, with communities and in communities for uh, research to benefit both communities and students at these institutions. My name is Jennifer Shirk. I am the director of the Citizen Science Association, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this plenary, whether you're joining us through SITSAI Virtual or on YouTube. And also my pleasure to introduce Veronica Bidding, one of the co-chairs of CSA's Environmental Justice Practitioners Working Group, who is going to introduce this roundtable and kick off this event. Veronica? Thank you so very much, Jennifer. And thank you to the Citizen Science Association for entertaining this very, very much needed, very necessary effort to highlight what's happening at our historically black colleges and universities. I bring you greetings from North Carolina, an alumna, alumni of Winston-Salem State University, and would love to introduce you to our moderator for today, Dr. Valerie Johnson, and who represents Shaw University, Dr. Russ Smith, Winston-Salem State University, Dr. David Padgett, Tennessee State University, Dr. Nataki osborne Jack, Spelman College, and Dr. Mark Burns of Morgan State University. Please be prepared for an enlightening and spirit-filled presentation where we take what we learn from the experts and practice practice those things in our communities. Thank you for the opportunity to participate and thank you all for participating. With that said, please enjoy this profound panel of experts. Welcome to SITSAI Virtual. A few reminders, you can see us, but we can't see you. If you are joining us in the Zoom event, you are welcome to ask questions to our presenters by using the Q&A tool. If you would like to chat with attendees on this topic, please go to today's plenary event in the SITSAI virtual group in CSA Connect and make comments there. The opening introductions have been recorded in advance to reduce technical glitches. We hope you enjoy this event and we will start with today's moderator, Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson. Pretty. My name is Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson, and I am Dean of Arts, Sciences, and Humanities here at Shaw University, an historically Black college and university in Raleigh, North Carolina, United States. I'm delighted to come to you today as your moderator and host for what I know will be an engaging and exciting panel. I am joined by panelists from across the country. And these are my colleagues, people who I know engaged in citizen science or community science as we often refer to what we do. So for today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself so that you will understand the context that we have here at Shaw University in terms of citizen science activities and practices. First of all, we are located in a downtown area of Raleigh, North Carolina. So we have a very urban experience. 
And even though we are a little bit urban, we're also quite rural in terms of our proximity to our rural areas and how the students can interact with nature spaces while they're at Shaw University. And it was because of this interaction with nature that I knew that we needed to also engage in citizen science. So my idea was to work with a variety of folks, different teams, to help bring citizen science to our HBCU. We are resource challenged, so we had to come up with ideas that made sense for our institution, for the ways in which we engage. In doing so, I was able to team up with what I call my NASA citizen science team, and we will are in the process of developing a curriculum that HBCUs and minority serving institutions can use in order to bring citizen science to their universities and colleges or to augment what they already are engaged in. We want this to be an effort that is not just located in our science program, but it happens across our whole curriculum so that everyone can have an opportunity to engage in and to touch science, to engage in research that is meaningful, that contributes to our greater society, but also is fun. You can't overestimate fun in when you're bringing something to young people. It is the way in which we've engaged them. It helps them have a tangible way, a material way to do the science whether they are seasoned practitioners and have been doing science since elementary school, or whether they're just coming to our sciences in their um, later years. Our efforts to engage in citizen science, community science here at Shaw University has also involved partners at North Carolina State University, primarily Karen Cooper, who has an ambassador's program and we are partnering with Karen Cooper and her team to do a project, Crowd the Tap, that has been funded and will be implemented in the summer. And that will allow students to work with students at NC State, as well as get out into the community to provide necessary information that we need to know of how leaded people's pipes are across the state of North Carolina. We don't have that information. And so here again is a way in which we actively and tangibly contribute to scientific knowledge, but at the same time allow students to enter into this area from where they are. And that is a key point. That's the thing that is a central factor in bringing citizen science, community science to Shaw University. We are starting from where our students are starting and bringing them past where we know that they can go. So we invite you to celebrate with us. Here are a couple of photos of our students who are in an English class engaging in citizen science. And they decided that since we had a couple of dry spells, that when they want to do and implement the Mosquito Mapper program, they are creating buckets of water in various places so that they can actually capture some of those mosquitoes as possible. So this is the ingenuity, the excitement that comes when students are engaged. And I really love the fact that this is an English class and not one of my biology classes that's engaged in this. However, I do have to say, we have our two other core classes in this initial pilot project, and they are from my um, biology courses. So we have had instructors take up the mantle, engage in citizen science, try it out, see how we can best implement it at our institution. In this round table discussion, we are going to hear from four other colleagues, Dr. Russell Smith, at Winston-Salem State University, Dr. David Padgett, Tennessee State University, Dr. Nataki Osborne-Jelts, Spelman College, and Dr. Mark Barnes, Morgan State. We will start with introductions, much like the introduction I'm giving you now. 
Then I will moderate a live discussion between our panelists. And then afterwards, we invite you to join us in a, what I know will be a robust conversation about citizen science and how we are implementing this, these kinds of programs at our historically black colleges and universities. We thank you and we look forward to a very wonderful, engaging, enriching, intellectually stimulating conversation. Hi, my name is Russ Smith. I'm a professor of geography at Winston-Salem State University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm also the faculty lead for the Spatial Justice Studio at the Center for Design Innovation. And I'm really happy to be part of this panel discussion today uh, where we're talking about issues related to environmental justice, uh, HBCUs and citizen science. Uh, a little bit of my background prior to coming to Winston-Salem State where I've been for the past 13 years, I was a practicing planner uh, working in communities throughout North Carolina, uh, local governments, nonprofits, uh, consulting a little bit, even state government. And during that time, uh, I always thought it was great when citizens engaged in the process, whether that be in uh, planning uh, documents and planning operations that we were doing in different locales uh, or coming in to take on projects on their own. And I've tried to incorporate that as well into the classroom and into my work at WSSU. Winston-Salem State University is an HBCU, a historically black college and university, of which there's over 100 across the United States. Uh, these were developed during an era where, of segregation, where African-Americans couldn't go to high, schools of higher ed that were white, and they were segregated, and they developed a, a platform and, and institutions all across the country to fill that educational void for students of color. Uh, the Winston-Salem State student is someone who's very interested in getting involved in citizen science and through the spatial justice studio of which I'm the faculty lead we use that as a conduit in which to connect community and students. We have a fellowship program that picks up to four uh, citizens every year to work on projects that they pick uh, and some of these in the past have included things related to environmental justice such as brownfield locations, uh, also um, uh, urban green space and urban green infrastructure. And these citizen scientists conduct the projects with the help of staff at the Spatial Justice Studio, of which I mentioned I'm the faculty lead, and the classes and students at Winston-Salem State. So we, we bring together those two worlds, the academic and the community through the citizen science uh, individual or activist who is interested in the projects that are particular to their community. And through those projects, we've been able to expose students to community issues, but also help the community members solve real world issues affecting their uh, neighborhoods and even the city and county in which they live. Uh, as I was mentioning, one of the projects that we've completed with the Spatial Justice Studio is uh, identification of brownfields. And for those that don't know, brownfields are abandoned, usually or potentially hazardous sites in urban locations. So examples of these could be abandoned uh, mills, abandoned industrial sites, old dry cleaners, old gas stations, where we know in the past, prior to current environmental legislation, they might have been using toxic materials, toxic substances that have gone into the soil, contaminated the groundwater, contaminated the soil themselves, and are in need of cleanup. And we, a, a, a lot of these are, can be found in older parts of communities in which we know there is a higher percentage of people of color living. And through this project, we were able to identify where these potential brownfield sites might be to then begin the process of remediating the brownfield locations and the contamination that are found in these communities. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, panel today, I think is a huge first step to trying to unite uh, what we're doing at HBCUs with the citizen science uh, initiative across the country. And I think it has the potential and where I really see the promise here is, is taking what everybody on the panel is doing in their isolated locales and trying to get break free from those silos and unite us and, 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 and get a bigger bang for our buck to actually try to create uh, uh, an energy that then can ripple across the country and institute real change, not for just the communities that we're all individually working with on this panel, but really uh, across the nation.
Once again, I just want to thank everyone, uh, the Citizen Science Association, Dr. Johnson, for moderating today, uh, the other panelists that are uh, speaking today with me. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. I look forward to our conversation, and I look forward to the work that is going to follow in the future. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. David A. Padgett, uh, Associate Professor of Geography and Director of the Geographic Information Sciences Laboratory at Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee State University is one of our uh, approximately 100 historically black colleges and universities. Uh, my presentation is entitled, uh, The Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment, uh, Historically Black College University Informal Education Institution Collaborative. Uh, and so what this is, is I've been a uh, GLOBE trainer uh, for about 20 years. Uh, the GLOBE program is a citizen science-based program uh, that is funded mostly primarily by NASA and sponsored by other federal agencies uh, that has as its primary objective improving science education at the K through 12 level, primarily through hands-on environmental uh, investigations. Uh, we found over the 20 years that I've been a GLOBE trainer uh, that there are very few historically black college and universities that are GLOBE partners. Uh, what a GLOBE partnership does is trains in-service and pre-service teachers in environmental um, science uh, investigations, uh, atmospheric science, uh, data collection, hydrologic science data collection, and so on and so forth. Um, our take on this um, initiative is to make GLOBE a lot more attractive to uh, people in vulnerable communities, uh, to teachers and students who are in inner cities. Uh, in many cases, environmental science and looking at global warming is presented in a somewhat abstract manner uh, with uh, polar bears and glaciers and trees and birds. Uh, things that aren't really in large, um, uh, aren't largely uh, seen in many inner city communities. And sometimes students and teachers can be turned off by that. Uh, so we had the, we meaning HBCUs and those of us working in urban schools had to take a different approach. And so that's what this project is all about. So Tennessee State University is part of the Globe Mission Earth Project and that's our funder through NASA. Uh, we have several other partners, Boston University, the University of Toledo, as you can see, and the uh, Globe Mission Earth Project uh, really focuses upon taking NASA um, resources and infusing them into the classroom so that students have a, a real world uh, experience in learning science. And NASA has so many assets, satellite imagery, and all kinds of assets that really uh, can be used to make science more uh, interesting to students. Last year, I created the uh, this collaborative, which joins historically black college and universities with informal education institutions uh, as GLOBE partners and GLOBE teachers. Uh, the reason that we made this pivot is because in many cases, uh, informal education institutions have a lot more flexibility than formal education institutions. Also, informal education institutions tend to have greater connections to the community and greater sustainability and longevity. Uh, formal education institutions have a hard time holding on to teachers. The way GLOBE works is I train a teacher in how to teach science. That teacher would go to a school that school becomes a globe school. And then that teacher uh, imparts the knowledge to his or her students over a period of years. However, we're finding now, especially in challenge schools, teachers don't stick around long. You know, we don't have teachers like my mother who taught at one school for 10 years, one school for 12 years, another school for nine years. Uh, teachers now, you're lucky if they stay one or two years. Uh, and in many cases, when a globe teacher leaves the school, that's the end of GLOBE. Uh, and now we have to start all over again. However, we find that if we work with um, 
Boys and Girls Club, after school programs, faith based institutions, anybody uh, who wants to become involved in GLOBE and expose uh, children in inner city and, and people of color communities to science is welcome aboard with this collaborative. And so we expect to expand this uh, across the board. What is key in all of this is that historically black colleges and universities produce 50% of black teachers. So out of, so even though we're only about 3% of the overall student population in the United States in higher education, we produce 50% half of black teachers. And so our vision is to have those black teachers who right now are largely not going into the sciences or teaching sciences, use GLOBE to convince those young people to say, look, you can make a difference in children's lives. We're gonna see more black astronauts and more black chemists and more black doctors in the future. You, you teachers are the key to making that happen and closing this um, racial STEM gap, racial STEM achievement gap. So here's our uh, collaborative. We're, we just started in Detroit, we're in Philadelphia, we're in New Orleans, we're in Nashville, we're in Atlanta with some very established uh, uh, informal education uh, institutions. And so we are, are already underway developing a sustainable curriculum uh, that can be used with informal education institutions or uh, be used at formal education institutions. And so we are uh, underway with our goals. And uh, every year we expect to establish uh, GLOBE partnerships at HBCUs. Tennessee State University is one of the very few historically black college university GLOBE partnerships. Uh, and this year we have a, a faculty member whose job it is within the College of Education, uh, Dr. Erlika Newsom. Uh, she is training teachers how to teach science. She's new, uh, she's part of our team, uh, and we wanna create a replicable model of using GLOBE uh, at, at in cities all over the United States. And at the end of the day, uh, we'll see more uh, young people of color become scientists. No scientists would be here without teachers. No astronauts would be here without teachers. I wouldn't be sitting here without my teachers. Uh, and so unfortunately, African-American teachers are significantly underrepresented in science teaching. And we tell them, you don't have to become a scientist to teach science, just have a love for it, just have a vision, just impart that spirit into a child who might not think he or she could become a scientist ever. I wanna be a basketball player, I wanna be a rapper, I wanna be a whatever. Uh, and, but one teacher, you know, I know what happened to me, uh, can turn, turn a student from that into a scientist. Um, if I have time, I just wanna show just part of what we are, are doing. Uh, so we already had a uh, citizen science based workshop for uh, young children in Detroit age 13 to 18. So these are inner city kids trying to get them to learn science. And so the organization is called the um, Green Door Initiative and their project is called uh, Climate Organizers Leading Detroit or COLD. And so this is a, a map that the students helped to create. Uh, they went out and collected data in Detroit using the GLOBE atmosphere protocols. And so, and then they pulled those data into an ArcGIS online map. And so they took uh, surface temperature measurements. We used degrees Celsius, which, you know, in the United States, you know, with everybody else in the world, Glo GLOBE is literally a global program. There are 30,000 GLOBE schools where children are doing citizen science all over the world. And not only children, GLOBE also includes what we call the GLOBE Observer app. And so what happened was people all over the world started to, who weren't involved in formal education said, we wanna collect GLOBE data. So the GLOBE program uh, created a mobile app that can be installed on a mobile device and can be used to collect data uh, by citizen scientists all over the world. 
And that, those data can be uploaded onto the global data visualization system. So a child in Detroit can collect these data on this day and compare them in almost real time to a child in, in Brazil or a child in uh, Mozambique who's collecting the same data on the same day. And they can go into the data visualization system and say, wow. And, and now today with, with uh, these, with Zoom and other conferencing tools, uh, when even we had Skype, we did a, a climate data comparison chat with some students in South Africa with ninth grade students here in Nashville, Tennessee. And that really opened students' eyes. Some of our students never even leave their neighborhoods, never leave their cities. Uh, and so now they can say, uh, I got some surface temperature data. I use a thermometer to get data in Nashville, Tennessee on Tuesday, March 23rd and, and quasi in, in South Africa did the same thing and they can talk to each other. You know, and it's, well, it's winter there, it's, it's, it's summer here, you know? And so those are the kind of conversations that, that we had. Um, so this is just the result of a uh, six week uh, workshop with children 13 to 18 that we're st still undergoing evaluation. Um, the kids went outside, they collected data. Um, and many of the children said that when they first started, they, did, they, they just knew that they were gonna get a stipend. And that's why they were there. Let me just hang in there for six weeks and get, the, get my check. But by the time they learned how uh, atmospheric constituents can affect their health in terms of asthma. Maybe their grandmother has COPD, and now we know that there's a relationship between air quality and COVID-19. Uh, a lot of them really connected, not only with us, but also I had my students, Tennessee State University students, engaging with these young children, because these kids who are 13 and 14, you know, they can't see themselves being me in 40 years. They can see themselves being one of my students at TSU in four years. You know, they can see that, hey, I, and so with social media, they can make that connection and perhaps completely change their perspective on whether or not they want to be a, a college student. Nobody in their household or their neighborhood might, might be telling them, you're going to college, you should go to college. But until they meet, um, Joey or or Haley, one of my students, hey, they say, wow, Haley's cool. Haley's in college. I think I can do that. Haley's doing the same science I'm doing. I think I can go major in biology at Tennessee State University uh, or wherever they happen to be. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about, how to expand this effort, how to expand this model to other uh, institutions, whether they be HBCUs or not. And at the end of the day, uh, put more science teachers in our classrooms through hands-on uh, scientific inquiry through GLOBE. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Citizen Science Association. Uh, thank, you know, I'd like to thank my partners uh, for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to further discussion. My name is Nataki osborne jelks I am an assistant professor in the Environmental and Health Sciences Program at Spelman College. Uh, and Spelman is a historically black college for women located in Atlanta, Georgia, and we are a global leader um, in educating women of African descent. Um, Spelman just you know, celebrated its 100th and, uh, 140th anniversary. We were founded on April the 11th, 1881. So I'm still kind of riding on that high um, of our Founders Day um, celebration as I, as I you know, delve into this talk. And I really reflect about um, the work that Spelman has tried to do as an institution. You know, obviously um, its first mission is, is about you know, educating um, black women and women of African descent, um, but 
but you know, kind of secondarily, um, Spelman is very engaged in the local community in which it is located. Um, and I bring that to the work that I do in the classroom. Um, teaching in the environmental and health sciences program, I'm able to interact with and impact students who are in three different majors. Um, we have students who are pursuing a BS in environmental science. Um, we also offer a BA in environmental studies and a BS in health science. And I get a chance to teach students across that curriculum. Um, usually my, my courses focus on issues around um, health disparities, um, environmental health, um, as well as um, technology and um, informatics. And so in doing that work, um, I always try to bring in opportunities for my students to get engaged in data collection and analysis. And we always try to look at it through the lens of what's happening in our local community. And so that means that we end up um, partnering with local community-based organizations um, to explore environmental conditions. And so in many of the um, pictures here that you see represented in this slide um, are some of my students engaged in water quality monitoring. And one of those pictures has a student engaged um, in conversation and monitoring with a community resident. Um, Spelman is located in the Proctor Creek watershed, which um, is one of the most impaired water waterways um, in um, the metropolitan Atlanta area. Um, it has received a lot of national attention as a part of the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, Urban, Waters, Urban Waters Federal Partnership sites. Um, and so there has been this investment um, from the federal level in looking at ways um, that communities can be, uh, or that communities can empower themselves with tools um, to improve water quality quality of life, um, as well as economic vitality in this watershed. And so in terms of that work, um, community members um, have partnered with our students um, on water quality monitoring and analysis. Um, we engage in, in programs in which um, citizen, um, community members as well as um, students you know, go out and um, monitor multiple sites um, in the Proctor Creek watershed. Um, we're looking um, to identify um, what the pollution stressors and sources are for the watershed. And we know many of those um, sources to be associated with an aged um, sewer system that tends to um, release raw untreated sewage mixed with stormwater into our creek. Um, this is important because Proctor Creek um, flows through people's front yards, backyards, school grounds, and public parks. Um, and, you know, as the watershed in which Spelman is located, um, it it um, is important for us to um, use the scientific tools and resources that we have at the institution, but also to do it in a way um, in which we are not only building student capacity to engage in research, um, but also growing that community capacity to be engaged in collecting data um, that will help us to um, you know, uh, create an agenda for change um, in which we are pushing for policy and practice solutions that will ultimately um, improve environmental quality as well as quality of life um, in, in this urban watershed. Um, so as we as we do that work um, collectively, you know, with community residents, um, our students, you know, get a get a chance and an opportunity to, you know, learn about um, issues, you know, happening locally from the perspective of community residents. We elevate that local community knowledge right alongside, um, you know, the data that we're able to generate through our community science activities. Um, and by pairing those things together, I think we get the best of both worlds. We get this scientific data that um, helps us to understand what water quality looks like, um, but we also get the benefits um, of this um, community expertise that folks have, you know, from living in a community for a number of years. Um, they see what the problems and challenges are. They have a very keen understanding of how their environment and quality of life are being impacted. And through citizen and community science and through this process of community engaged research, we're able to collaborate to um, develop research questions, um, but also to um, go out and to find the answers, to collect the data, to analyze the data and to come to some shared understanding um, of what that data means. Thank you, Citizens Science Association and Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson uh, for inviting me uh, today uh, for this talk. Uh, always on the front lines, historically Black colleges and universities engaging in citizen and community science. Um, that's definitely a true statement per the documentary titled, uh, Tell Them We Are Rising the History of Black Colleges and Universities. Uh, 
as representing Morgan State University, founded in 1867. Uh, certainly, Morgan has always been uh, on the front lines. And as Maryland's preeminent public urban research university, Morgan fulfills its mission to address the needs and challenges of the modern urban environment through intense community level study and pioneering solutions. Uh, this isn't too far um, from the work of Chief Justice Thurgood Marshall, uh, who was also a beneficiary of a historically black college education. Uh, he was perhaps one of our very first environmental justice pioneers uh, in the work that he did to desegregate the nation's public school system uh, using but a camera and clipboard, uh, the tools of citizens uh, everywhere. Uh, he showed resource disparities in transport uh, and classroom facilities to bring, a, bring about that landmark decision. Um, hoping to gain uh, as well as contribute uh, insight uh, and thoughts uh, around how we uh, can further uh, enhance and advance community and citizen science. So, thank you so much, everyone, for your introductions. And now we're going into the live portion of our program today. And there are some questions that I've already posed to the panelists, but we also want to be able to respond to the wonderful questions that are coming from the, through the chat. The first question I do want to start with to give each one of you a little bit more time to give details about your respective institutions. That's one part. And the other part of that is, and um, Dr. Barnes, you started with that. The title of this particular um, panel is all about always on the front lines, dot, dot, dot. And so I think as you weave together something about your institutions, how they enter into this conversation and why we're saying always on the front lines. So I'll open that up to whoever would like to start first and we'll go from there. Thank you. So since you raised this bar, you know I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Start, start us off with why uh, sure, something sure. more about Morgan and why always on the front lines. Sure. Um, uh, certainly our mantra is growing the future, uh, leading the world. Uh, founded in 1867, uh, we have grown from uh, a basement uh, into a, a full-scale campus. Uh, I, I like to call the city uh, roughly about uh, 8,000 students, uh, both graduate and undergraduate uh, at the time, uh, right now, currently. Uh, and you know, Morgan uh, has been, again, always on the front lines uh, around education, uh, even back in uh, the 1960s, uh, didn't get the notoriety that other uh, HBCUs did uh, here in Baltimore. Maybe that's the reason um, being uh, sort of more Northern uh, than Southern, uh, but definitely uh, students participated uh, in sit-ins uh, in the 1960s. Uh, movie theater, Northwood Movie Theater uh, in the neighborhood uh, called Northwood uh, here in Baltimore City, uh, and also at a drugstore called Reed's. Uh, actually, in 1947, even, uh, they were, uh, students were at the state capitol, uh, again, uh, just protesting for equal uh, resources uh, for education for Morgan. Uh, and as many may know, uh, even most recently, uh, there's been a landmark uh, decision uh, around, uh, again, education uh, equality um, with the four uh, of the uh, three uh, HBCUs, Coppin, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore, uh, Bowie, and of course, uh, Morgan State. Uh, so we, we've always been uh, here uh, doing the work, the important work uh, to address uh, many of the 
of issues, uh, environmental issues, uh, whether we're talking about natural environment or social um, or even the built environment issues uh, that many marginalized, uh, vulnerable, and also oppressed uh, groups uh, face uh, here in Baltimore City and beyond. Thank you. Anyone else would like to weigh in on some more about your institution and why we think this is important is to understand the context from which our students are engaging in science and engaging with communities. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm fine to uh, throw a few words out there. So uh, at Winston-Salem State University, been around since 1892, our motto uh, is enter to learn, depart to serve. And that works very well with getting students interested and engaged in topics. Um, I know from my experience, having been on campus for, like I said uh, in, the, in the talk there, a little more than a dozen years, is that um, communities surrounding campus that are historically and predominantly um, communities of color, they look to Winston-Salem State historically and even now for um, engagement, for opportunities, for uh, the university to participate in issues that they're interested in. And one of the reasons we founded the Spatial Justice Studio three years ago was because so many of the issues that were affecting the community have a spatial dimension to them, whether those are specific things occurring in communities uh, related to gentrification, urban heat islands, um, food deserts, transit deserts. Um, these are the issues that are real for the communities around campus. And while you know not all students that on campus come from the communities near campus, they face those same issues in the communities that they come from. So even if they're from more remote, even not urban, but rural spaces, they know these terms, they know these things. And so they are immediately drawn to these concepts and ideas, and they want to come learn more. And then hopefully where we're sending them is, is departing to, to serve, to go out into the communities and work in the fields that, that where I used to be in, in urban planning or in transportation planning, environmental engineering, all these different things that they are getting some a taste of at Winston-Salem State through our programs uh, and then going on further in their education and then giving back to the community. If I could just add briefly to that, um, I mentioned earlier that um, Spelman was founded in 1881. And so I think it's interesting just to look at the context in which uh, we were founded in 1881 in Atlanta, you actually had black women who were launching um, a strike. These were mostly domestic workers. Um, and so they were launching this washer women's strike, um, you know, fighting for, uh, in, in terms of their working conditions, their wages, the hours that they worked and the injustices that they were experiencing during, during those times. And so when you think about sort of the genius of um, the founders of Spelman coming together um, to start an institution to educate Black women, um, it, it's, it's just extremely important. Um, one of the more recent models of Spelman, even though this was not our initial model, um, but what we hear a lot now is, you know, a choice to change the world. And so yeah. we are equipping and helping to set the conditions so that our students can become empowered um, to be change agents in their communities. And so they see this model, whether we're talking about classroom projects or just the requirement um, that Spelman students have to complete a certain number of hours of community service that are conducted and performed um, within a 1.4 mile radius of the campus. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we are connected um, to this community that we are a part of, um, and that it's our responsibility to give back. That's very much a part of our mission. And so it gets carried out in projects, in opportunities like citizen and community science, um, you know, like work that happens in our Bonner office of um, civic engagement uh, in which we're actually working, uh, I, or I, am, I and uh, some community-based organizations are now working with that office to provide an experience for first year students in which they will get um, a deep dive into numerous types of citizen and community science projects um, as a part of their first year experience. Um, so, you know, for Spelman, it's, it's, it's uh, a part of our DNA 
I would say that we are um, reaching out to, we're engaged with our local community. And so as we think about the issues and challenges happening in our communities, um, we have to, uh, and we're doing the work to equip our students to be engaged in that work, regardless of whether they're transient or not. Um, they are a part of this community when they're here at Spelman. Um, and so we wanna make sure that our students are making these connections and are out um, doing work that will enrich their college experiences, but also uplift the surroundings communities. Thank you. Um, Dr. Padgett, is there anything else you'd like to add um, before we move on to our next question or do you want to incorporate um, some of your ideas and thoughts as we move to our next question? Yeah, we can, we can move forward. I think those who have <laughs> spoken have said everything I would have said. And I felt that it was really important to do this because just as the other institutions have spoken, Shaw University began in 1865. And again, it, it began at a time when African-Americans were coming out of enslavement, but they were co-creating the institution with um, Northern philanthropers. And so that tie to community is material, it is real, and it's an important way of understanding how we leverage the resources, whatever we have to do the work that needs to be done. So my next question goes toward more toward the citizen science and um, how do you incorporate citizen science in your classrooms and include in your response some of what your students have been doing after they leave the classroom? Yeah, I guess I can, I can address that. Um... My, um, I've been a GLOBE trainer and partner since uh, 2001. So GLOBE stands for Global Learning and Observation to Benefit the Environment. And it's a, um, it's really a citizen science based program that has, it's funded mostly by NASA. I put the link in the chat. It's funded primarily by NASA um, to teach teachers to teach science better. Uh, in our country, uh, a lot of teachers get no science training during their pre-service teaching years, and then they're thrown into the classroom and are expected to impart scientific knowledge upon uh, students at the K through 12 level. And frankly, a lot of them might not be equipped to do a good job. Um, but the GLOBE program uh, is a, hands-on scientific inquiry-based uh, program that really focuses upon environmental science and encompasses a lot of uh, the issues that are impacting environmental justice communities. And so it's great to have our students, pre-service teachers or not, engage in hands-on you know, atmospheric science data collection, hydrologic science data collection, and so on and so forth, uh, and impart that knowledge to their students. And then what we're doing at Tennessee State University is expanding past the formal educational structure. Uh, you know, GLOBE started in formal education and um, now we're seeing that, especially with everything that happened last year, we see that there are a lot of constraints uh, that, that, that are upon the formal education system that informal educators don't have. You know, informal educators do things on Saturdays, no problem. Formal education, Saturdays, forget it. You know, so uh, after school, informal education, great. Connecting families to informal education, great. Like, like the, uh, um, you know, one of our partners is uh, Dr. Osborne Jelk's uh, West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. And so, you know, it gets communities and families involved in ways that formal education institutions can't. So that's our, that's our big mission now. Uh, is to get more specifically black teachers trained in science, take them in the classrooms with our black children. So what they say, if you can see it, you can be it. Um, you know, that's our larger mission. Uh, yeah, just look, I guess building on that, um, when I first started, many of the projects that I had included in the class were, were kind of papers and, you know, some, some basic research off the internet for students of things that I was interested in. 
and what I realized and things that I knew about felt comfortable with. And then I, as I've grown kind of in this, uh, in this position and uh, offerings is I realized that the students they were just fulfilling a task. They were just trying to get the grade on the paper, on the assignment, on whatever it was to check it off and move on. And, and it was a disservice to the project, to them, to me. And so where we've gone, especially with the Spatial Justice Studio, and I'll put um, in the chat here in a minute, the website for, for the studio and our, our Twitter handle uh, is, is solicit grant or solicit ideas from community members of what do they want in the community in Winston-Salem where we're housed, uh, where we're located. What is the issue affecting the community? We have a committee that ranks those. We fund four of them every year. And then those individual projects, whether it's on brownfields, whether it's on urban green infrastructure, whether it's on the relationship between public housing and public education. Um, we, we've had you know, a, a myriad of things that are listed on the website. We then use those ideas. It connect the researcher, the citizen researcher with the classroom, with the students to then build the project from there. And the students get so much more out of it, one, by providing this service, but they also feel more connected to it because they know something's riding on the outcome, that it's more than just the grade, their participation, the getting a 90, getting a, a passing grade, whatever it is, but they're trying to help the community actually tackle issues that are affecting them. Uh, and, and even if they're not from the city of Winston-Salem, they still, for these years, call it home and, and, and want to do well. So I've seen, I've seen development or I've seen a lot of development and growth uh, in terms of the student's interest, the performance uh, by using this kind of model of development. And part, and this is um, a thing that we want to get to um, in talking about the role of community in the kind of work that you are each doing. I think that there is a question um, that Ms. Fighting wanted to um, answer. I'm gonna let her interject here. And then we're gonna go back to some more responses. Ms. Fighting. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. We have one anonymous question that I felt needed to be asked. And the person inquired as to whether the students that Dr. David Pageant and others work with feel welcome in the field of citizen science? If not, why? And they asked if you suggest how the field can be more welcoming, supportive, responsive, and I'm certain inclusive. Yeah, I'll, well, fortunately, the service mission is part of the HBCU mission. so. There's no conflict. <laughs> you know, our motto at Tennessee State is think, work, serve. So I, I understand the question. I mean, I, I've been at majority institutions where in not in all cases, but in many cases, the whole idea of getting involved in community issues and getting involved with communities, you've got the whole this whole town gown divide that we just don't have at HBCUs. I mean, I mean, there, maybe to some degree for some sec segments of the community, there might be a town gown divide that if, if you watch uh, uh, Spike Lee's film, uh, School Days, there was a classic scene with Samuel Jackson, you know, you know, so we do have that. But in general, um, you know, our students have no problem. I mean, this whole service learning, we, we've been doing that since we opened. You know, that is his name for it and everything. So my students have no conflict. They they want to give back. They they want to engage. They're they're not, you know, we only have to tell them. <laughs> the one thing that we have to tell them is that the community does not work on a semester schedule. You know, so I, had to, I had to tell one of my students uh, who is a gentleman we work with named uh, Mr. Joe Womack in Africatown and the student was going to interview him. And but he said he's not going to be available until June. And I said, please don't email Mr. Womack and say, I've got a paper due, Mr. Womack. You got to do this interview. And, no, you just, <laughs> that's the only thing that we have to get students to understand is that we're on a community schedule, not our schedule when we do this kind of work. But in terms of any, uh, anything else, they're, they're ready and willing to do it because that's just part of our DNA at HBCU. Very much so. And 
this also um, points out, not only is there the town and gown divide is, is a little bit different than what is usually depicted. Also, so many of our students are coming from impacted communities. So they're coming looking for the tools and the answers. And so to think of these HBCUs and MSIs as being um, deficit is to me a mistake. You have to think of them as having resources, but how are they going to be deployed? How are we utilizing the talents of our faculty to connect our students with community? And how was that dialogue fostered by the administration? These are the questions that we have to ask, you know, how are we going to, if you've got a 5-5 teaching load, how do you indeed do a citizen science project? How does that get a part of your curriculum? How do we talk to our future educators, as Dr. Padgett is talking about, um, in order to get them involved in ways outside the classroom when that is precious time, you don't have a whole lot of time. So these are the kinds of questions that we ask and solve those answers. So I think there are a couple of other questions, but I wanted to make sure, Mark, is there anything that you want to interject yeah. here? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I wanted to, uh, address the issue because uh, I'm, I'm thinking about my interactions with students uh, and you know the whole idea of um, what is meant by citizen science right uh, and I think you gotta kind of I want to kind of uh, explore that just a little bit unpack that uh, a bit um, because it's not actually um, a phrase or term uh, that uh, I know is used widely uh, at Morgan so I think that's important uh, in my Intro to Geography course. So uh, like many HBCUs, many HBCUs uh, may have one, possibly two, maybe three even geographers. And you all have three geographers today. Uh, so uh, here with you, you know, imagine that. Uh, and, 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 and it's critically important to understand that. And of course you have, you know, this, um, STEM, which geography is a part of. Uh, but what's in the name? And I always have this conversation with students uh, in thinking about uh, once we get to the lesson plan on uh, place names, otherwise known as toponyms, right? Um, and, you know, names hold meaning. Um, sometimes may, names can also um, connect you to places, right? But they also can, can repel you. Uh, and so we, when you even think about, we, we go through this exercise and we talk about you know, a name like Baltimore City and the images that uh, that name uh, evoked for, for many um, here, not only in the city, um, but, but elsewhere uh, can be an uninviting place to be. Uh, and some of our students, uh, and this is just the reality, um, you know, it, it, it does take a little bit to get them out and about into community places. It's a real thing. Uh, and so I think you wanna take a look at, you know, the notion of, um, you know, what we call things and, and who's also speaking, which is in, extremely uh, in, important. And the way we break that down, uh, we break that down uh, by, you know, connecting with the student first, right? Um, I'll ask a question like, you know, what, what's the meaning behind your name? And sometimes students are, have no idea or, or clue. And we go through that whole process. And, and I tell them uh, even uh, that, you know, if, if, even if you don't know, you have to inject meaning into, into your own name. Uh, and I think that's critically important. So injecting meaning, what is meant by you know, citizen science, uh, whether you're looking at brownfields, uh, whether you're looking at, again, uh, quality, water quality uh, in neighborhoods, uh, the neighborhoods that uh, are here. Some, some sound really great, like Cherry Hill, and, and David is from Baltimore, but he knows that a place like Cherry Hill and even Sandtown um, are very sort of disadvantaged uh, places, communities, neighborhoods. Uh, however, some the names sound really great. So I think that's that's extremely uh, important to to um, address. 
uh, what we mean by citizen science. And, and, and thinking about our students, they're, they're citizens themselves um, who come to Morgan and learn. And I like to think about Joseph Campbell's uh, A Hero's, uh, a Hero's jur Journey, uh, where he speaks about um, departure, initiation, and return. You know, sort of the three phases of becoming sort of a, a hero. And we have a number uh, of students who come from far away and of course even leave their neighborhoods here in Baltimore City. Um, they go through this whole process, this education process. That's the initiation. Uh, and hopefully they will return and bestow the booms uh, that they've acquired um, through their, their learning experiences here at Morgan. It, in their own neighborhoods, in their homes. So uh, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. And that also reminds me of um, Nataki. You've talked about in other, um, other times about participatory research. And since we're talking now about, you know, how do we name things? And this is probably getting at, at a root ball of our discussion, citizen science versus community science versus community-based participatory research, all of these names that we give, what is it that we're doing? And I'd like to start with you because I know that you have some ideas about participatory science and what that, that kind of model means. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Johnson. So, you know, I really approach this work from the perspective of um, collaborating with local communities. And so as I'm able to bring this into some of my coursework and, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's a little limited in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, spend time on the, nomen the nomenclature, you know, we try to spend more time on the actual doing, let's get out in the field, let's, you know, collaborate, let's talk to community residents, let's hear about their concerns and let's try to, you know, use the scientific uh, skills and tools that we have to try to address some of those issues. But to the extent that I can really talk about um, this nomenclature and what we call what it is that we do, I really try to focus on um, really laying out for students this a continuum of opportunities from research that is very much um, directed and, um, and um, I guess, um, conceived by, you know, an academic uh, or some other type of researcher, um, all the way down the line to, you know, research that is um, developed and designed, you know, by community residents. And so we look at these um, different parts of this continuum and we look at ways that the community can empower itself in the process, um, how we at an academic institution can aid that, um, but at the core, how we can collaborate with, um, how we can co-develop, how we can come up with research questions collaboratively and make sure that those research questions are rooted in uh, problems and challenges that are in the community. Um, so that if we're conducting research, we are, you know, not doing it for research's sake um, and, you know, not to, um, it, it's, it's nothing against those who, you know, do it for the, um, the, the enjoyment around discovery, um, but it's how can we use scientific tools and processes to address real life problems happening in our communities today? Um, and, you know, what, you know, what do we have in our toolbox that will help us to answer some of those questions? And it's so important um, that the questions come out of the community um, so that the potential um, solutions, you know, that come out of that research can also be directed at the community and can benefit the community itself. So I, I really try to take this, you know, deep dive, a very quick deep dive, you know, into sharing that with, with students um, so that they can understand um, and kind of see themselves in the process. You know, we see our own positionality, um, but also see again, these, these opportunities to collaborate um, in a way that is meaningful um, in a way that is not extractive, you know, when we talk about, you know, studying what's happening in a community, um, but in a way that is, you know, elevating those community concerns and at the same time, elevating local community knowledge, you know, understanding that there's this lived experience that we can 
bring together with the data that we're able to collect. Um, and in many cases, we're able to um, tap into more fine grained data that isn't available, say in publicly available data sets um, that helps us to fill in important gaps about environmental conditions in particular that if addressed can uh, improve environmental quality, health and quality of life um, for uh, local communities. Thank you. I would also um, remind folks that another model that is out there is community owned and managed research that was um, developed by Omega and Brenda Wilson at the West End Revitalization Association. And I say this deliberately because here is a group who involved with researchers at UNC Chapel Hill as what the questions came out of concerns that the community had and how were they going to address legally some of the injustices that they were facing as they continued to be dumped on in various ways in their community. And the community came up with this model. And so some of the questions that I'd like all of you to answer or to, to contemplate now is, how do you identify community partners? You know, we're talking about how to open up um, citizen science to a broader group of people that several questions have come in. How do we get more people involved? What would you say to people asking this question? I know the different ways we can do, but what are some of the ways in which you would suggest people engage a citizen science more broadly? Yeah, well, I always tell my students that you know, we have to be in the community at times other than other than in times of crisis or if we're trying to do academic research. You know, if there are some black owned businesses in the community, you know, patronize them. If there's um, a, a music festival, if there's a, a store that sells wig, whatever, you know, patronize the uh, black owned business in the community, be in the community so that your face is familiar. And so I, I, I used to actually, up until a couple of years ago, just live in, I guess, the hood, uh, very close to campus. And um, so when I, when, I mean, a lot of the um, projects I would get on, I'd be in the grocery store and somebody would walk up and say, uh, aren't you that map guy? Or aren't you that science guy at TSU, uh, and I'd say, well, well yeah. Um, and then we would start to talk and they'd tell me about a flooding problem or an environmental justice problem or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my word of advice. Just, just be, even if you don't live in the community, spend time there so that people know you outside of academia and outside of you know being in a crisis EJ situation. Yeah. I, I'm yeah, no, building on that, I totally agree. Um, I, I've i taken the, um, I guess, the model, the initiative, the idea of the community comes to us looking for help. Now, of course, people need to know you're available. So like through the call for participation for the Spatial Justice Studio Fellows, um, word gets around. Um, I, I try to actively serve on, on different boards and community initiatives just to be there but I, I don't I'm not formally being like hey what can we do to help um, or let, let me come up with a class project from your community it tends to be the other way around that people seek out uh, assistance and then we have a, a, a frank conversation about what are their needs and what what can we do no, knowing that um, uh, some things might not be suitable for so you have to be able to say no. You have to be able to say, well, or point them in a different direction or show them other resources that, uh, that not everything um, is possible. And, you know, uh, Dr. Padgett was talking before about being on the academic schedule versus being on the community schedule. That's something that I, that's usually one of the first things um, that I, I, I kind of talk about. Uh, maybe I'm not on the same exact wavelength as him because the students do have deadlines and papers and everything and saying, well, you get the interview in when you can. Um, depending on the thing, but I try to make the community understand that, you know, the students at the end of the semester, if it's the end of the academic year, might be going home, might be leaving. And so there has to be just a frank conversation about expectations. What is the community looking to get out of it? What are the, what are the students going to get out of it? 
how can we how can we make both those things work? Um, and again, in some situations, we have to say, well, maybe this isn't suitable for this uh, type of this this project isn't suitable for um, the model that we're 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 trying to pursue. Yeah, and I'd like to add also, you know, work with your local media outlets. Um, uh, and that's one way that Tennessee State University has really improved. We used to be ignored. Our, our students could do, we do be doing wonderful things in the community, never see it on the news, never see it in the papers. Now, if somebody got, gets shot on campus, oh, you know, lead story. I mean, I mean, we had a, uh, something happen on, we had a student that got shot on campus, unfortunately, at graduation uh, a few years ago. And the next day, it was like, news trucks literally from all over the country parked all along. And I'm like, well, when our students do something good anyway, but our media department at Tennessee State University, it really pushes out there, uh, you know, the great things that our students do in the community. And so when people see that, then uh, they're more apt to, to call, they know who to call about different things. And so, um, you know, sometimes our local media just kind of ignore HBCUs, but if, you know, we have to really push our local media to, to, to talk about the good things that we're doing in the community that others can see. Yeah, and I'd like to uh, share that, you know, first thing is a rec recognition of the power relationship between institution and community. That needs to be acknowledged. That's critically important, um, regardless of it's a HBCU or other MSI, that's critically important. Um, so, you know, there's the patriarchy um, and, and some communities do have, even um, with all good intentions, right? Institutions, um, you know, do work. However, there's always something is, again, as David said, um, a student being shot, but sometimes, you know, some students can, can, can have an effect on the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, communities that that don't uh, put uh, the institution in the best position to to build the partnerships. With the partnerships, you got to really also focus on honesty and integrity. There is an agenda. Quite frankly, there is an agenda. Acknowledge the agenda that the institution or the foundation, uh, in terms of the funder, uh, possibly. Um, Acknowledge that uh, persistence is, is key as well. Um, continue to build the, the partnership. And it's even before, during, but especially after the project might be done, continue the relationship. Continue the relationship because, and continue to build that relationship. So don't just go in a month, two months, maybe you know, a project might last for three months or so. And then that's it, and they and, and the community don't don't hear from um, the professors or, or students ever again. Maintain the relationship, and so I just wanted to share that. Thank you, um, Vincent Martin has an interesting question, kind of along these lines, but more um, pointed toward. This he says, COVID nineteen affected the African American communities and different communities in different ways. But how can HBCUs lead in the research to collect the data that disproportionately affected their community? And I think he touches on a really key point: How can HBCUs lead in the research to collect the data and not just always be sub awarding? And for those who are not familiar um, in the research world, oftentimes you may be brought in to do research as um, a sub awardee rather than being the lead on the particular research. And so maybe y'all want to talk a little bit about that because it does impact implementation of citizen science at our campus. Yeah, I guess that's a, a dual level question. For, first, in terms of our students and we had to pivot last year, um, you know, I created a project where the students um, had to collect data uh, about urban population vulnerability to COVID-19 uh, in various cities and then post, post it up on a um, ArcGIS online map. 
and then the students presented that live during uh, GIS day. Uh, and so that, I didn't have to sell that assignment at all. I mean, they wanted to know. Uh, then my, um, uh, jo Ms. Ms. Joey Batts, a student that just graduated, uh, she's a microbiology, biochemistry major, her senior project was taking the COVID-19 hotspot data and looking at it a different way in terms of, of mapping. Because, you know, because of HIPAA laws, it's very difficult to get finer level uh, health data, especially with COVID-19. But when we're looking at, okay, where do we put our um, uh, vaccination centers? Where, at one time, where do we put our testing centers? And we know what was going on then. A lot of them were not in our communities. And so also we noticed that research showed that there was a, a, a relationship between COVID-19 and particular matter 2.5 exposure, which also compounded the impact upon African-American communities. So there was a need to have a, a, a different way of mapping uh, COVID-19 risk in order to highlight you know, the fact that our communities were even more at risk in order to justify the need for testing centers in our community and vaccination centers in our communities. And so, you know, so that was was her research and it, it, it got her immediately involved in, in, in communicating with people outside of Tennessee State University. Um, and it's really, we shared those maps uh, with the community because we use an alternative mapping uh, strategy using uh, contact tracer data instead of testing data uh, which we could then drill down to a much finer level of geography to get hotspots instead of through testing data um, results. And so if I get a chance, I might share one of the maps that she, she created. Um, but yeah, so just getting our students involved uh, in the research hands-on immediately uh, is a way to get them to serve the communities and, and, and exposing those disparities. Uh, now the funding issue, uh, I'll let somebody else <laughs> take that on. I know it's a dicey one. And um, one of the challenges that we can speak about is how do you become part of the big institutional data networks or um, funding networks that provide support. And I'm talking about like NSF, NIH, NIE, NIEHS. Um, if you haven't been regularly funded, it's really hard to get into that system, especially when you may have um, varying challenges within your own uh, particular institution. So, there's work, to, what I'm saying is there's work to be done around trying to get that lead, um, those lead positions in doing the research. And I'd also like for y'all to interject here, what are some of the strategies that you've employed to get the, re, to get some of those research grants? We've heard from David. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in there. So um, mm -hmm. what I've been able to do is actually um, use other people on campus. Not I'm the as as we were talking about before, I am the only geographer on campus. So um, don't necessarily have people to lean on within my discipline, but uh, made acquaintances, sought out people that I knew were successful in other disciplines and, and you know, took them to lunch, had meetings kind of just because it is, it's a process. And I remember the first time I went through it, I thought I did all this and then I didn't get it funded. Man, this real, that's a lot of work to, to get told no. Um, but, but then by the second one, it felt a little bit better and I did get funded and been successful in implementing it. So, you know, part of it is, I guess, trial and error. I really do encourage people to, to reach out to, uh, I think it's easiest uh, on, on your campus because some of the documentations, uh, some of the documentation you need 
is you don't have to reinvent the wheel and create it from scratch. There's some of the stuff that if somebody else has already received grant that you might be able to take and incorporate into your proposal without just starting from, uh, from, from A. And so I think that mentoring has really helped me um, move forward uh, and try to secure those funds uh, at, at Winston-Salem State. Yeah, yeah, I will add that um, participating on the um, uh, on panels for like the National Science Foundation in um, in uh, assessing and judging uh, other proposals uh, is a way to get our voices heard. Uh, so to be actually part of the um, evaluation process for grants allows us to get our voice out there as HBCUs. And one of the points that I always make is that, is that, you know, why do we have to always go to, or, or we're expected to go to the um, majority institutions to figure out how to diversify science, technology, engineering, and math, when we know that HBCUs far outproduce um, majority schools in producing sciences, scientists and engineers and PhDs across the board. You guys need to be coming to our schools <laughs> and figuring out what we're doing. And we don't have uh, uh, people with 26, 27, 30 on the ACT come to our schools. We can take somebody with a 15 ACT, four years later, they're in a PhD <laughs> program. You all need to come here. And I was working uh, on a large NSF funded project. And um, it turned out, turned out that um, uh, the leadership had never been on an HBCU campus ever. And we used to get in these huge arguments about how, you know, it, you, you, it's not a one size fits all solution. What might work at the University of Maryland probably won't work in Morgan State. What works at uh, Georgia Tech probably won't even work at Spelman in terms of resources and so on and so forth. And yet, even with the disparities, we outproduced them. And so <laughs> we finally got the leadership on this NSF project. This was a multi, over $10 million project that was meant to diversify STEM. And when these folks got on the HBCU campus, they were like, uh, well, What's going on? When's the, when's the, when's the presentation going to start? You know, they thought they were expecting to see a usual room with the screens and cameras. Not that we don't have that at TSU, but that room was being used by somebody else. So we had somebody had to, had to roll the card in, you know, and we walked around campus and then they got it. Oh, this is what the HBCU campus is like. I said, yeah, you know, but yet even under these conditions, even though they've been robbing us, like what happened in Maryland and how we just found out that the state of Tennessee has robbed Tennessee State University of half a billion with a B dollars. Uh, even with that, we still outproduce you all. So when we sit on these panels, we can make those that clear to um, program managers and others who are designing these uh, calls for proposals or, or and um, a request for proposals. Uh, and they can then maybe design these things more differently so that an HBCU MSI has to be the lead institution. Uh, and y'all come here, see what we're doing, you know. Um, so anyway. And Serving that actually, I think, addresses a question that came up in the chat about how do we get HBCU citizens involved in citizen science projects in astronomy funded by NASA. You need to come visit come to our institution, come see where we are, see what we're doing, how we are doing, how we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, and I would challenge anyone on this call, what do you know about the institutions that are in your state that serve mostly um, BIPOC folks? And I can guarantee you that somewhere in the, at least in the United States, for the most part, you look at where the populations of BIPOC folks are, there's going to be some kind of institution servicing that, that they go to. What do you know about it? Have you ever been? Have you ever been curious about what these institutions have to offer? So I just had to get that <laughs> two cents in um, before 
this, and we are going to stay on a little bit past the um, the time as much as we have time to do so. Um, Mark, I see that you opened up. Did you have something you wanted to interject? No, not at the moment. I was having uh, an issue here. Of course you were, and yet you <laughs> resolved it, didn't you? And that's I don't what know. You <laughs> Veronica, I think you had a question that you wanted to answer. Actually, Dr. Johnson, those questions were, I think, answered. What th There was one that may have been a little more detailed than uh, some of the others that uh, came from Jay Benforado. He basically wanted to thank the panel and he asked if there, are any, if there was any advice for groups that wanted to help increase diversity, inclusion and equity in citizens, com citizen and community science across the US. There is evidence that participants of many citizen science projects tend to be white, affluent and educated and thus don't reflect the demographics of American society. What can we do to participate and include all parts of society? And I think that was basically touched on, but any additional feedback may be helpful. I mean, I'll just, I'll just add to that, that um, we've just got to make, you know, our scientific pursuits more inclusive of a broader number of people, um, just generally speaking. Um, you know, what is the relevancy, you know, of what it is that we are, you know, researching um, to a broad number of folks? You know, are we, you know, in some cases, you know, we might be, you know, pursuing things that um, not a lot of people know about. And so that might be a little bit more challenging. Um, but I always like to look for these, you know, opportunities to help people to, to understand how this, you know, why this might be important to their everyday lives. Um, and that seems to be a thing that that works, particularly as we talk about students, uh, student engagement. Um, you know, it can be different, uh, very similar, but perhaps a little bit different as we talk about, you know, just the general public and how we diversify um, and make our science more inclusive overall. Um, but, but those are the types of things to think about, you know, who, um, and as I, I think Dr. Barnes mentioned earlier, you know, what are the power dynamics? Who's making the decisions? Who's developing the research questions? Who has an opportunity to contribute? Um, you know, and are we just developing uh, opportunities for people to um, engage at a basic level in data collection? You know, are, are they engaged, you know, in data analysis, interpretation? You know, again, all the way back to developing those research questions. You know, how can we open up these opportunities um, to get people in on the ground floor of them? Um, and when that happens, you know, if people have some ownership in things, um, then usually there's a lot more interest there. Um, so those are just a few things to think about, but, you know, take any citizen or community science project um, and you might have to start sort of in a different place, depending on where that project is, you know, what the subject matter is, um, you know, who's at the table. But, you know, I think those are some things to think about. Yeah. And I would include also reaching out and thinking about our different faith-based organizations and how they play in whatever community that you're interested in. You know, who's running the, the local daycare in the various neighborhoods? That's an opportunity to do some kind of a project. Who's at the barbershop, beauty shop? I mean, it, part of it comes to thinking very creatively and what about your visual and performing arts community? How, we're holistic beings. And if you want to be diverse, part of it is thinking more than just um, the narrowness of the, the thing that you want to document or research, that you'd be surprised at the people who are interested in birds. Um, it may not be who you actually think of in the typical Audubon community. But there are those who have an enormous interest in avian populations and just waiting to be asked, how do I funnel or channel that interest? May, may I add to that? 
again, this is all conversational. Uh, it's, it's really not as far and distant as uh, David mentioned, Dr. Padgett mentioned, uh, in terms of polar bears and glaciers. The conversations begin at home. Um, the conversations begin in the dinner, at the dinner table, if you will. And, you know, I speak to my, like, my weather and climate class, and I've asked them, how would you talk about climate change to someone that may not know <laughs> about climate change? Where do you begin? Uh, and we had a moment. It was like a five-minute stare down that could appear like an eternity um, for, for a class, right? But I, I said, I'm not going to, to say anything. And one student raised her hand and said, justice. She said, Dr. Barnes, we don't, we don't talk about climate change. We talk about justice and Black Lives Matter uh, and the like. And I said, OK, so what do you say? talk about? And, and as she began to discuss uh, you know, what BLM meant to her peer group, and you know, I said, hey, it's no different. I mean, in terms of climate change, in terms of impacts and things of that sort, um, the, the only difference is the names. I go, I go back to names. I said, you just have names to connect to police brutality. Whereas, you know, when we talk about Hurricane Katrina or any other uh, extreme event, uh, for example, Flint, Michigan, uh, water pollution, and like, we don't have the names of the people who are uh, severely impacted, affected, you know, lost their lives as well. But we can begin there and we can talk about climate justice, right? Uh, and we also have to begin or must begin uh, with the young people. Like David said earlier, the, 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 it's, it's incredibly important to participate in public education in, in this particular way. So here in Baltimore City, we made national news uh, for young people and their teachers sitting in classrooms huddled, right, in the bitter cold. This happened a couple of years ago, and even heat uh, extremes uh, in the county, in Baltimore County, uh, where parents were upset that the schools had to uh, close because of the extreme heat and uh, the fact that they, they lacked uh, proper ventilation, HVAC systems out in the county. So that we're not even talking about Baltimore City. And you have those conversations right there. Uh, in fact, you even have in Philadelphia, you have asbestos exposures uh, in one school. Uh, and I've had students do map journal projects on those kinds of issues. Uh, and so this is a very pervasive problem that affects everyone. And the important thing is to direct their attention at what happens on their, in their daily lives, not something that's happening um, when we think about climate change that, again, is geographically or tempor temporarily uh, distant. Those things are unfolding at this very moment. And to be able to have the conversation um, is, is critically important. And, 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 that, and folks are having those conversations. Uh, and so, but invest in public education, invest in historically black colleges and universities, and you will see a change. You will see a change in the diversity of uh, persons who are participating, you know, in, in this work. And I, I just wanted to add, I think talking about what you call something, uh, the first 10 years or so at WSSU, when I talked about urban planning or urban geography, groans, you know, people, oh, okay, what's this about? I'm not really interested in this, started the term spatial justice. And the students had never even heard that term before. But all of a sudden, everyone's, oh, wait a second, tell them what's this? What's spatial justice? What is it? What does it entail? Does it range from climate change to all the other things we've talked? And now, now, now we have a mind, now we, we're within our justice studies major, which everyone associates with criminal justice, we're having a concentration beginning in the fall in spatial justice and sustainability within justice studies, talking about how a just city can be uh, created and formed 
out of these concepts and thinking about access, inclusivity, equity across urban spaces, which is also urban planning and urban geography, but people weren't interested in hearing about that. <laughs> but spatial justice, everyone, you know, kids are signing up, they're interested, they wanna work with the studio, they wanna get engaged in projects. And on the community side, they're also welcoming this because it's something that maybe they never had a term, a name for, but now that they do, they're like, I know this, what this means. I have experienced spatial injustice in my neighborhood, in my life, you know, what, whatever it might be. And to hear that maybe there's solutions to these problems and there's a new way of thinking, um, even if it's an old way of thinking, it, it's, it's very helpful. And I think that is an important note for us to sort of wrap up and conclude with is how do we stay connected and networked? We're all at different stages in um, how we deploy citizen science at our respective um, campuses. But we started off at the beginning talking about with um, Dr. Paget, David, talking about being connected and growing the network. So what are some things that as we close out, you can offer in terms of connection network and continuing to support our various institutions? Well, I like to share that I've been able to uh, network collaborate um, with Dr. Paget uh, on a number of occasions thus, thus far. Uh, and I'm really also looking forward um, to connecting with others. We've connected uh, through what we've had here at, or have here at Morgan State, which is the Geospatial Collaborative. Uh, and uh, working with David has been, uh, and just kind of seeing uh, him uh, and his uh, leadership uh, through the American Association of Geographers has, has just been uh, amazing. Uh, and so he's, he's extremely inspiring. Uh, we also were able to uh, connect through uh, a grant uh, through the National Science Foundation's um, Build and Broaden uh, Initiative. Uh, and that's a, sort of a, a partnership effort where uh, we um, are uh, hosting, actually this fall COVID put the, um, the stop on uh, the conference, the Race, Ethnicity and Place Conference uh, that was supposed to be held uh, last fall, but we'll do an in-person uh, event here in Baltimore City. Um, just a, a shameless plug, sorry, <laughs> Race, Ethnicity and Place Conference. Uh, and we, we do a workshop that uh, focuses on geography and, and geospatial uh, sciences. So the, the network uh, is being built, is, is, is growing. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm a very uh, gregarious type of guy. And, and so um, I'm always open to um, make, make those connections. Yeah, I would ditto that and just say, um, you know, it's all, it's all about connections and partnerships and opportunities to collaborate. Um, I definitely think, you know, HBCUs need to unite in this space and do more work together. Um, it sounds like, you know, some institutions are working together, but perhaps others um, are not. Um, so, you know, just an, an invitation for us to kind of think a little bit um, expansively about, you know, how these collaborations can happen. Um, I'm not a geographer, but I do study, um, you know, race, place, um, environmental factors, and the, the role that it plays in our health. Um, and so uh, I'm very focused, you know, on, um, you know, on places. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that there is an opportunity to, to collaborate uh, on a number of different fronts. Um, I would also say for those who might be with um, PWIs or, you know, other types of institutions, um, think about HBCUs as partners also in your work, um, but I would invite you to not think about us in the context of, you know, kind of checking the box um, mm -hmm. or, 
um, you know, just a, you know, a last ditch effort, you know, you know, even as we're thinking about uh, opportunities for funding, you know, the question was asked earlier, how can HBCUs lead and not always be, you know, kind of the sub award recipients, I think that we need to, um, to not only be leading, but, you know, when we are sub award recipients, um, there needs to be a lot more equity um, in those processes, you know, don't come to the HBCU at the end once, you know, the, the money, the pie has been, you know, almost completely divided and you have a little bit of a something that you want to, you know, give to the HBCU, but then um, capitalize upon the engagement of that HBCU to talk about, you know, broadening participation and all these other things, you know, so think about HBCUs as more equitable partners um, in these processes moving forward. And as you answer, please put in the chat y'all's um, contact information. I know some of you already have been doing panelists, um, so that people can contact you, so that we can stay networked, because I think that all of what y'all are saying is very key and important. And a question came in to the, from the chat, um, or one of the Q&A questions, and that had to do with um, how do communities get in contact? Um, how do they share their problems, solutions, and ideas? So if a community is struggling with an issue, um, check in with that HBCU or MSI institution if there is one in your area. Or you can contact any one of us and we can get you connected. I mean, we represent um, a kind of Southern and, and Eastern um, geography, but we have connections all West and globally. And so for our global, um, participants, we do um, emphasize being connected across our planet because it's important. And so that information is in the chat. Um, I see Jennifer is here, Russ, you have closing remarks. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, I really appreciate the conversation today. I hope everyone out there in, enjoyed it. And that um, I, I think I'm speaking for everyone when, yeah, like you were just mentioning, reach out to us, go to find us on the web, send us an email. Uh, everyone's putting kind of different information into the chat. Uh, it, it takes that someone taking a first step, don't know there's a, a project potentially or a, a, a problem until people reach out. And so, um, and, and you gotta be persistent too. Uh, you know, I think those of us on this panel uh, are very active, maybe even proactive in our approach. Maybe not all our colleagues are that way, but we need to, we need to convince them, we need to push them, we need to show them the way. And so you might reach out to someone and, and not get a response, uh, especially if it's over the summer. Um, and, and, and you, you, you know, so you just, just stick with it. And, and I've appreciated it. I, I'm having to jump off the call to move on to another meeting, but uh, it's been a great conversation. I hope we keep going. I'd love to see this group reconvened in some format, uh, in some 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 way, so we can keep kind of the conversation going and uh, keep the connections alive. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you all so much. Before Russ leaves us, I want to thank my panelists, Nataki Ashburn jelks Russ Smith, David Paget, Mark Barnes, all doctors, all important folks. And when I say that, I don't mean just because they're doctors. I mean, because of the passion and work and commitment that they brought to, that they bring to what they're doing. Thank you, Veronica, for bringing us all together and Jennifer and Liv, Liv for helping us kind of put together this, I think, um, wide ranging discussion. We kind of broke apart what we mean by citizen science. And I think we did so in a good way. So thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, and to all of you for joining us. Please feel free to drop off if you need. I'm gonna just quickly share some closing thoughts, uh, but no worries to Dr. Smith and others if you need to go. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for devoting your time uh, today and your energies to this work ongoing. Um, and for infusing this conversation into the SITSI virtual community and beyond. I will say that you all have been posting your contact information into the chat. I will, we will be consolidating that and sharing it back out for the SITSI virtual audience in case folks were not able to catch this live. Um, and we'll also 
infuse some of those questions back into the SitSci virtual platform so that hopefully this conversation can continue and have a life um, beyond this event as well. Um, the last thing that I did want to say, and then we can keep chatting if you'd like just informally as folks trickle out, is uh, that we hope uh, to continue to grow as a partner as well for networking some of these conversations and with HBCUs and other institutions serving um, BIPOC students and communities across the US. And I'm grateful to our environmental justice practitioners working group for leading us in this direction and for also showcasing opportunities to support youth leaders as young scholars and up and coming um, leaders, both in their communities and in their fields to be finding and elevating their voices uh, as part of this. And so I hope to connect with you moving forward to look at ways that we can do this and carry this conversation forward in that way as well. And we're able to do that and this panel also with support from our, our sponsors, including NASA and this panel in particular with support um, in part from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So thank you to them for investing in this. And we look forward to learning with you how we can continue to grow as a, a, a partner for the field and supporting your work. Thank you again. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate, appreciate my colleagues' time. Enjoy your summer projects. Um, I look forward to hearing more about all of what you're doing and really connecting with you. I'm serious about that. Shaw's ready to partner up and to work. So we may be a little bit um, newer in this field, but we're an old institution. So you can help us shake it up a little bit. Thanks. Good, good seeing everybody. Thank you. Likewise, great discussion. You well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. And Liv is sharing here just to close out the final slide highlighting some upcoming plenaries. Our last plenary talk will be with Sylvia Acevedo um, talking about science confidence and competence and her own life story and work to impact at scale youth Ooh. and others across this community, uh, across um, STEM learning environment. So please join us next Monday for that as our closing. Okay keynote. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Veronica. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Johnson. This was a wonderful Thank you, Dr. Episode. Valerie Johnson. Great job, Valerie. Well, thank you. I think we had a great discussion. And it, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I think so, too. I think um, mm -hmm. it gave people something to think about maybe a little differently than um, what he, they normally do. And I see Vincent is raising his hand. <laughs> his hand and I can actually give him the microphone if if we're open to that. <laughs> Are you yeah. able to stay on? Please do. Hey, Vincent. Wow, y'all was great. Y'all knocked it out the park. Y'all did. I mean, y'all rounding the bases. Wow, I'm <laughs> wow. Great, great presentation. You know. Thank you. We so wanted to represent. <laughs> Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and and and, and I, I put a question there because I was I wanted to see about how can community colleges, because like I say you know, HBCUs are not represented up here, so most of everybody get pushed towards all the other colleges. But now with this virtual learning, that just open that's that, that just changed the whole game. So that's something we need to look at. But but great presentation. I am like wow, oh. Oh, thank you, Vincent. Thank you for thank coming. You, Vincent. But oh, speaking yeah. of that community colleges, I'm just going to say that I know Shaw has um, a community college relationship with the community colleges in California. So there are um, ways to be in in these cooperative agreements with the HBCU. So. Oh. I got Wayne County community here in, in Detroit. Uh, you know, I know a lot of the faculties and they would probably love this kind of venture. 
Okay, we have to let me, talk let me, then. Let me see what we can do. Yep. Take care. Everybody, great, great production. Applause. Take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Thank you again, okay. Dr. Johnson. I think we are closing. Where is this a wrap, right? I think it's a thank wrap. you, Dr. Johnson. Great job. Oh, thank you all. You all made it so much easier, especially that beginning, you know, letting us do the introductions the way you did. It calmed me down. And I think that was really good because it set us up to be able to have a good conversation. So thank you. Thanks for taking the time to do this. I know it was a tough time of the year. <laughs> it's okay. I'm ready to go and I'll see you all later. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye.